بسم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا Welcome all to a talk entitled Purification of the Soul. And when I was thinking about this talk on the purification of the soul, I thought that in reality everything, everything in Islam and everything we do on a day-to-day basis when it comes to our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that in fact is purifying our souls. Every single thing we religiously conduct and undertake, every single rite and ritual that we hold dear to us, this prayer that we had prayed, the moment where our Father calls us and we reply to our Father saying, Oh Father, what is it that I could help you with? The moment that our mothers call us and we reply to the mother with a similar reply, all of that is purifying our souls. All of that is purifying. So purification of a soul of our souls is a process that we are undertaking on a daily basis. What is the result of the person who purifies his or her soul? And what is the outcome and the danger of not purifying the soul? Both of these the result, the fruit, the reward of the individual who purifies his or her soul and the outcome and the consequence of the one who doesn't do that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of both of these in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ Indeed of a surety the person who has purified the soul of his he has gained prosperity وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَ and the one who hasn't been able to purify, rather he leads it further and further into the pits of immorality, then this person has, has done what? He has become a loser. Qad khab. Indeed of a surety. Definitely. So the one who is working towards purifying the soul, then that is an opportunity to gain prosperity. But notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, about this prosperity by saying Qad aflah, indeed of a, of a surety. This person has gained prosperity. But it's not just any type of prosperity. You see, my dear brother, my dear sister, the thing about the word aflaha, gaining prosperity, but with this particular word or verb, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to have an imagery in your mind at, at that moment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to think about something. At that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to visualize an image. And that is the image of a farmer. Because a farmer in the Arabic language is known as a fallah. A farmer is known as a fallah, which is the same root word or the same relative word, if you mean, if you care, if you please. Same derivative as aflah. Allah wants you to think about this individual who is a farmer. Day in and day out, this farmer is working with his crops. Day in and day out, this farmer is picking up the water and taking it to the land and irrigating this land. Day in and day out, this farmer is working towards growing this crop. Six months go by, seven, eight, ten, twelve. As the time proceeds and the crops go through their regular course and all of the effort is put in and placed within the irrigation and within the preparation of these crops, finally at the end, this person will be able to gain the reward, the fruit, the crops. It takes time. But the reward is beautiful. It takes time. But the feeling of joy that a person will get at the end of it is going to be absolutely beautiful. 
It's going to be remarkable. It's going to be a feeling that will be like no other. If you get paid once a week, if you get paid twice a month, if you get paid once a month, then that pay that you get once a month, you get some sort of feeling for that, but it's not as much as the farmer that spends 12 months of his year, not knowing at the end of it all, will he be able to reap the fruit for what he had sown? Not knowing whether he will be able to get a reward at the end of all of the effort that this individual has placed. Allah wants you to think about your soul that you will be working with. Think about your inner existence. Think about your heart. Think about your mind as that example that I had just given. That you'll have to work and you'll have to irrigate and you'll have to work harder and you'll have to work harder and you'll have to fuel and eventually at the end of it all perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept the soul of yours. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate this soul of yours. Zakkaha, the one who ends up elevating the soul. You see, the word zakka, yuzakki, it comes from the word zakka or zakat, which means an increase and an influx. When a person has purified the soul of theirs. I ask Allah to purify our souls. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. When a person has purified the soul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the action that the person undertakes. There are people out there who are silent, but anything they do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places blessings within their actions. Anything that they do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the apparent Reward of that particular practice. Look for example at that individual that nobody else in the community had, had ever known. But one day he got up and he said, you know what, I have to do something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after he got up, he said to himself, I will be making a masjid by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One person, perhaps a community of people come together and they're not able to do it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless the efforts of one individual and you have within a year, within two years, an entire operational center. But people get together in large numbers, but the ikhlas, sincerity, the purity of the soul is missing. Allah does not accept this action because Allah had told us, in Allah tayyibun Allah is pure and He doesn't accept except pure. Those are the actions that will last. Those are the actions that will increase. Those are the actions, the fruit of which you'll see. You know why? Because when the heart has become pure, and the purity of the blessed pure statement of La ilaha illallah has gotten its roots within the heart, Allah tells us what happens next. Allah says, مَثَلُ كَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ The example of a, a pure word is like the example of a pure tree. أَصْلُهَا ثابت. Its roots are firmly grounded within the ground. وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ and, and the branches are towering within the skies, within the heavens. And what, what do the branches do? Do they just hang there and look pretty? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تُؤْتِي أُكُولَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا This tree that you have, the branches of it, it continuously provides the fruits from those branches whenever and at every single moment by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you firmly ground yourself within the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be but a walking, talking fruit. You will be but a walking, talking tree that is blessing people with its fruits. Sometimes you meet a person, and it doesn't have to be a person of knowledge, but you meet a person at every single moment that you meet, there is something you remember of their character. There's something you remember of their actions. 
There's something you remember of the beautiful way in, in which they interact with people. There is something you remember and may even perhaps lead you to tears of the way that they would interact with their peers, friends, society at large. Perhaps as they're driving, they find a rock within the ground sitting there and they move their car to a side and stop it and pick it up and move it aside. Those are memories that are unforgettable. But those are memories of a person who has established himself within this purity. But what happens to the person? The one who has not purified the heart. The one who has not cleansed his heart. The one who has not worked on the soul. The one who has not thought about the inner dimension of himself. The one who only thinks about the external world. The one who knows nothing but money and, and physical things. What happens to such a person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this person, my dear brother and sister, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and I. Ameen ya Rabbil Halim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this person has become a loser. Qadha. He has become a loser. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us an existence which has intellect attached with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored us over other creatures within the world by giving us a brain with which we can think, a mind with which we can ponder, a heart with which we can feel. But if we take all of those feelings and we take our brain and take our mind and take our heart and subset those feelings and do not think about any of that, then what do you think will happen to us? Allah says that this person has become a loser. This person has lost. Because he himself has chosen the path of losing. He is taking the virtue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him, the mind, the heart, the feelings, the emotions, and himself brushing all of that aside. The saha, the scholars, they said, akhfaha. He hides it. Because you know what? There is inner beauty already within us. Allah's Messenger وسلم, told us of this. He said, That every single child is born on the innate purity. And then the parents are the ones that end up leading him astray. But the child himself has already been brought up and already been born on this purity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of this in a hadith Qudsi as well. ibadi hunafa. I created my slaves. I created my worshippers hunafa upon the pure monotheism. Then the Satans they came and they took my slaves away from, from their deen. So essentially Allah has already placed within you the beauty of fitrah. When a person chooses to, to subdue that, when a person chooses to, to put that aside, to brush it aside, to overlook the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within the heart, then at that moment Allah says the person will become a loser. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect and preserve us. In both instances, in terms of prosperity and in terms of loss, Allah says this is going to happen. It's a definite. You have been given internal beauty. What is expected of you is to increase that beauty. You have been given an internal innate nature for you to be able to capitalize on the talents that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. What is expected of you is to do just that. And how do you do that? And how do I do that? Let me lead you, my dear brother, my dear sister, to a surah that is dear to all of us. And to a surah which is known to all of us. And to, to a surah which is the single greatest surah within the Qur'an. Within the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that being Surah Al-Fatiha. The surah that we read every single day, multiple times a day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken this surah and Allah has divided this surah up between his slave and between himself. As he says in the hadith Qudsi, قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نَصْفَيْنِ I have divided prayer between myself and my slave into two portions. 
And when my slave says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, my slave has, has praised me, and so forth. So it becomes a conversation between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the very center of this surah, three verses before and three verses after. In the very center of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the conversation between him and his slave very personal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us at this moment to say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Indeed, you alone, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I worship, and you alone, O Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, I ask for help. Why do I want to why do I talk about th this specific verse? This verse is going to be telling you and telling us and teaching us and training us on how to treat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to treat ourselves simultaneously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse that you alone, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we worship all of us. This is a conversation between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though it is a conversation between you and Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes, makes the noun, the pronoun a plural. You alone, we worship. All of us. And that is to be reminded of the fact that we have to come together as a community and it can't be a person by himself. You have to come together in the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the impact that we have on each other is a very, very powerful impact. And that's why the great sociologist by the name of Ibn Khuldun from the eighth, around the eighth century, who was one of the first sociologists actually in the history of the world, he writes and he says that that a human being is madaniyum bi tabi'ihi. A human being, in terms of his very nature, the way he's been created, he happens to be, he happens to be a social creature. So you have to socialize in order for you to get out of your personal setting. At times we are stuck within our personal setting and you know, we've got the kids, the wife and the husband and the work and this and that. You need the break, you need the time off. You need the retreat. Why is it today that some of the best businesses in the world's world is people making packages for retreats and vacations? Because people need time off. You need that feeling of communitas. You need that feeling of which, which sociologists refer to as communitas, where you take yourself out of your community and then you end up going to a... a a small setting. And in that small setting, all of you have the same purpose of, of rejuvenating yourself. And that's why we go for Hajj as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the opportunity to come together as communities in every single week, once a week. And that is Al Jumu'ah. And that moment, we're supposed to be coming together even greater than the daily chore and errand an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, and that is the five times a day. And along with those two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us yet another opportunity to come together as a community, a global community, and that is for Al-Hajj. So the idea of community is very, very necessary for your spiritual development. By yourself, in your house, behind a computer, behind a... Closed doors is not how you develop yourself. You develop yourself by being amongst your fellow Muslims, by seeing the beautiful action, and by being encouraged by the examples that you see around you. And for that reason, in the very, very beginning of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to emphasize this meaning. Many a times you'll be at home praying by yourself, right? And Surah Al-Fatiha is something you recite in your salah. And in fact, Allah's Subhanahu wa ta'ala in this hadith Qudsi even calls Surah Al-Fatiha a, a salah, right? But even then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to speak in the plural. Why? Not because it's the royal we. This is a we for you to realize. This is a we of recognition of the fact that we are a people all together. Together we are strong. 
Together we strengthen one another. Iyaka na'budu. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to recognize your station from the very, very onset with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your station with Allah is that you are His servant. Your station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you are His worshiper. Your station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a station of obedience, of servitude, of understanding. And that is where the elevation of yourself will come. You know, sometimes we ourselves, we lose track of where we are as human beings, right? And one of the ways I find that's very beautiful for us to understand where we are and where we stand as human beings is when we fly. You know, if you get in a plane and you're flying, as you're flying, you'll see little dots on the planet. There's human beings all across, right? And then those dots will disappear, then you'll see cars. And they'll become dots. And then they'll also disappear, and then the trailers will become dots. And the houses will become dots. And then they'll all disappear, and you'll see nothing but plain land. And then that will also disappear as you protrude with the plane into the, into the sky, into the heavens, into the clouds. And when you're all the way up, you can see nothing anymore. And that is just a small example of our insignificance. But us, we forget that. And despite the fact that we are so insignificant on this entire planet, let alone the entire universe, we start to feel like we are on top of the world. Why? Because we got this car, because we got this job, because we work here, we work there, because we are able to afford these shoes and we're able to afford that house and so on and so forth. We forget who we really truly are. This is how we insignificant we are within the world. And so for that reason, from the very beginning, Allah wants you to recognize your insignificant. Allah wants me to recognize my insignificance. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ You alone, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we worship. And notice that right after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us that you alone, O Allah, Allah tells us to say this at us, you alone we worship, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah reminds us of another phenomenon. And that is that you alone, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask for aid and help. We ask other people for aid as well. But there are those things that no one else is capable of except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that moment, what is expected of us is not to turn first and foremost or let's put it this way, there are those moments where we find ourselves incapable of doing something. At that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to turn to the physical means of the world first and foremost. That is to be done, yes, no problem. But the first thing that Allah wants you to do and Allah expects of you is to raise your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to remember Him and to ask Him and to invoke Him and to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone as a first result as a as the first thing that you resolve to. and you know what we within ourselves whether we accept it or not we have a weakness within ourselves not to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I want you to imagine for a second I want you to imagine the moment where you felt the weakest in your life where you felt like there was nothing that you can do to recover from the weak point that you are in. Perhaps it was a sickness, perhaps it was a car accident, perhaps it was you yourself at school where you felt like you will be kicked out of school and you can't do anything about it. Perhaps it was work. As you were at work, you felt like you were in a soft spot. You, you got stuck in a soft spot when it comes to your work and there was no way out of it. At that moment was your natural instinct to turn to all of the worldly means, or was it to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? At that moment, did you pick up the phone first and call the individual that you thought could best solve this problem, or was it that you connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and raised your hands before Allah and asked Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal? What was it? Moreover, if you were in front of people, your friends, your family, 
other people around you. Did you feel shy to raise your hands before Allah and ask Him? Because that is a shyness we feel. Wallahi we do. We feel shy to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That very person who is incapable of anything, if it wasn't for the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give him capacity and capability, we are willing to ask that individual without any shyness. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we feel shy of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is that Lord who had told us that He Himself is shy of a person who raises His hands to Him and asks Him that Allah leaves those hands empty-handed. So who is more deserving of your shyness? And who is more deserving of your question? And who is more deserving of your first and last stop? That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe you me, if you ask Allah and you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the correct direction, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your call. You know what that correct direction is? The correct direction is as follows. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had told us of this in a hadith Qudsi. And that hadith goes as such. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that no slave of mine comes closer to me like those things that I have made obligatory upon him. There is no way for a slave to get closer and closer and closer to me, more so than the angle of and the route of the actions which I have made obligatory upon him. The prayer that I have made obligatory upon him. The hajj that I have made obligatory upon some. The zakat which I have made obligatory upon some. The siyam and the fasting which I have made obligatory upon some. Allah is saying, this is the closest you can get to me. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, He says that there is no slave that can get closer and closer, more so after the obligatory actions, than those actions that I have that I have given him the opportunity to do. It's an opportunity. The voluntary deeds that we have been that Allah has prescribed for us, that's an opportunity. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues in this beautiful hadith. He says that when he does all of those things, then I will become, I will love him. When I end up loving him, I become the hearing, the ears that he hears with. When I become loving of him and when I love him, I become the sight that he sees with. And I become the feet with which he walks. And also I become the hand with which he strikes. And I then end up answering all of his calls. Now if he comes and asks me, I give to him. Now if my slave asks me, I don't deny him the question. Now if my slave seeks refuge in me from anything evil that he sees around him, I end up giving him that refuge. Why? Because he had done fulfilled my rights. And then he's rightful to ask me as well. And this is the same thing that Allah is telling you in this verse as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? You alone we worship, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you alone we ask for help, right? Why is that happening? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, you alone we worship first, and you alone we ask for help? Because when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts your questions. When you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at that moment, you are a rightful individual to get, get, get answers for the questions that you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made you a person who's rightful to ask Him for His guidance or ask Him for anything you please, the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you and I to ask is what? إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمَ Guide us, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the straight path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq. Ameen ya Rabbil Now you've done all of that. 
ideally, if a person has already worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person has already took all the means in order for the question to be accepted, and the person has also asked the right question, ideally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to that question. Isn't that so? The person has worshipped Allah. He's come to Allah from the right door. He's knocked ensuring that 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 is the right way to go. All of that has already been done. So isn't it so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually open that door and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually give that grant? So when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ Guide us, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the straight path. It's only natural that Allah will give you that straight path. And He does. How so? When you're looking on the Mus'haf, when you're looking on the Qur'an, all you have to do is look to the other page and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the book within which there is no doubt, هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ It is a guidance for, for the people who have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brother, my dear sister, your place of guidance is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your route to be being elevated in terms of your spirituality is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you connect yourself to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you'll find yourself being elevated. The more you connect yourself to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you will find yourself by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, the more you'll find yourself closer and enveloped within the mercy of Allah. The more you'll find your actions. Remember, we said zakaha means that the actions are also elevated and increased. Allah places barakah within these actions. The more you'll find that those same actions, the same $10 that you gave to the masjid, that were, if they were done with a soul which is pure and has been purified, then that is a soul which which will naturally cause the impact of this money to increase and the blessing within this money to increase. I ask Allah to give us the tawfiq to practice to convey. My message to you then is that in order for you and I to get closer to Allah by increasing our relationship with Him and by purifying our souls, we have to first and foremost check ourselves and make the Qur'an the index for all of that. Sometimes we need to ask ourselves, where do we actually stand, right? It's not just about here's the route and this is the, the map in order for you to get to wherever you're trying to get to. In order for you to get somewhere, first and foremost, you have to figure out where you're standing. Do you want to test yourself? Allah has given you an index. Do you want to, make, do you want to find out where you are standing and how deep you've gotten into the waters and how shallow the waters still are, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the index. You look in the index and figure out which, where you are, and believe you me, you won't have to flip many pages before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell you where to go as well. It's not like the map book where you actually have to get to the right page. The thing about the Qur'an, Allah has made it mathani. Allah talks about this particular phenomenon within the Qur'an as well. He's made it mathani. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it oft repeated. Meaning that there's a lot of repetition within the Qur'an. As you're reading the Qur'an, you'll see, you'll see things that will move your intellect. You flip a few pages, you'll see things that, or even that same page, you'll see things that will move your emotions. If you need a reminder on patience, you'll find it within five pages. You need a reminder on fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll find it within five pages. You need a reminder to be reminded of the fact that your gaze need to be lowered, you'll find it also as you're going. You need to be increased in your hope, Allah will talk about Jannah. You need to be increased in your fear of Allah, Allah will talk about hellfire. So Allah has in place chapters, why? Because all of it is a reminder. Doesn't that happen many times people say, I open the Quran and any page I find what I'm looking for? It's as if Allah was speaking to me. You know why Allah has made the book like that? Every single chapter in the Quran speaks about everything. Everything which is significantly important. So your index is there, and your guide is there. I ask Allah to give us the tawfiq, to practice, to convey. Jazakumullahu khairan for listening. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.